the title of the talk, How Hybrid Excitons Suppress Charge Separation Ultra Fast But Delayed. It's quite a long title. Basically, everything I'm going to speak to you about today can be summarized under um, if this works. The short title of my talk is Coulomb Rules. It's really the Coulomb interaction <laughs> uh, um, that uh, governs, I mean, you all know this, but uh, it's sometimes good to go back to the basics and realize that's, that it's very basic fundamental forces that determine all the complex properties of matter. And uh, yeah, I hope you will agree with this uh, during my talk. Let me motivate um, the presentation with like the motivation that we use for our research. We are interested in current technological challenges energy storage generation, data processing, catalysis, hot topic here as well, <laughs> optoelectronics. And um, these, these five areas are obviously very different. And you know uh, this also, um, they have functional elements, uh, all of them, solar cells, batteries, LEDs, transistors, and so on. And although all this looks very different, they have uh, three important aspects in common. Uh, the first one is that in all these uh, elements, it's the interface that uh, governs the functionality. And um, across this interface, we have either energy or information transfer. And uh, the fundamental processes, the elementary processes happening there, they happen on ultra fast time scales. Yeah, it's about electron transfer, charge transfer, energy transfer. And um, this is what we are interested in. And um, one um, example is the solar cell. I think I can go through this uh, quickly. Um, you know that we put light into the solar cell and then we want to separate charges. And um, this is the rate limiting step. And it occurs at the interface of different materials. And there are various materials that are frequently used in solar cells. And uh, one, um, one approach to improve fu uh, functionality and efficiency of solar cells is to combine inorganic semiconductors with organic semiconductors. The reason is uh, that uh, these uh, are often transparent and conductive and uh, can have high charge carrier mobilities, which are useful for the technological application. Well, here we have the chemical tunability and a very strong light matter coupling that we have under control, or at least the synthesis tells us they have it under control. Um, so uh, candidates for inorganic um, semiconductors are uh, the commonly used TiO2 and also zinc oxide. They have a band gap uh, that is in the near UV, so visible light can just go through it. Um, and um, have uh, quite similar properties, except for the dielectric constant. Uh, the dielectric constant of TiO2 is much larger than zinc oxide. And of course, they have a different structure. Um, the, the issue is that zinc oxide um, is a promising material for such applications, also for LED applications, for example, because, um, and it's even better suited because you can, fabricate nanostructures much more easily than in the case of the TiO2, but unfortunately it doesn't work very well in reality. And um, the reason is for some reason at uh, these inorganic organic interfaces, the charges are not efficiently separated if you use zinc oxide. And this is one question that we wanted to answer and uh, the reason for this. So there, there has been a lot of work different scenarios that I will present later on. Um, and this is one motivation of the work that I will be presenting today. But before I talk about the hybrid interface, I will first speak a little about zinc oxide. We came to zinc oxide, I don't know, 16, 17 years ago. This is how we started. And we very naively thought we just give it a go. And yeah, it took quite some years to conquer this material. But now we believe that we have uh, the electronic structure of zinc oxide surfaces quite well under control and we understand it quite well. And um, this I want to share before I move on to the more complex system because it's also important to understand the substrate. 
So what we do is ultra fast spectroscopy. This means we uh, want to look at what happens in a material after absorption of light on femtosecond or picosecond time scales. So in order to do that, we use a controlled approach. Um, uh, we use a first laser pulse. It excites the system, brings it into non-equilibrium conditions. And then uh, we use a second time delayed laser pulse. And by changing the time delay, um, we can then monitor the material properties as time proceeds because the second pulse does the spectroscopy step. Today, I will only show you photoelectron spectroscopy results, but of course you can also do this with nonlinear spectroscopies, um, optical spectroscopies, uh, et cetera. There are different approaches. So everything I'm showing today is photoelectron spectroscopy. We have the two laser pulses. They um, hit the sample and then we look at the photoelectrons that are emitted. Um, we measure their kinetic energy and their momentum, and we count how many of them we get at different energies. And by this, and depending on the choice of the pho photon energy that we use, we can either look at population dynamics and normally unoccupied states, or at changes of the occupied electronic structure, like the whole manifold of uh, electrons, and um, this depends on the photon energy that we use for probing those photoelectrons. And um, yeah, we do this uh, not only energy resolved, but also um, we resolve the momentum parallel to the surface. So we learn something about the degree of localization of the electrons. And just as a rule of thumb, uh, I would like to remind you what you learned in the textbooks. Delocalized electrons have a parabolic dispersion, while localized states have a flat dispersion. Yeah? So this is how we disentangle them. The degree of the, the effect, effective mass determines the degree of delocalization. Okay, so when it comes to photo excitation of, um, of um, matter, uh, there are various processes that are important in particular uh, when you look at the ultra fast time scale. So here I'm comparing photo excitation of a semiconductor and a metal. Obviously you all know that the semiconductor has the Fermi energy in the gap. The metal has a conduction band that is partially filled. And then we photo excite the semiconductor. We create holes in the valence band, electrons in the uh, conduction band. And then in most semiconductors after relaxation to the band edges, they form excitons, bound electron hole pairs, and they have a binding energy that is determined by the dielectric function of the material. In metals, the situation is different. We also have the attractive Coulomb interaction that leads to the exciton formation, but it is screened because we have free carriers at the Fermi energy, and they distort, they uh, contribute to the screening, and so we can monitor the single electron dynamics in a metal. And then we can create metal-like properties in a semiconductor simply by exciting it sufficiently strongly. Uh, this is well known. You uh, uh, generate many carriers in both bands, and then um, these form quasi-Fermi energies in both bands where you have free carriers. Those free carriers also contribute to the screening in the system, reducing the Coulomb interaction between electrons and holes and the theorists in the room, the DFT people know this uh, enhanced screening then leads to a band gap renormalization because the Coulomb interaction is reduced and the band gap becomes smaller. While we have these carriers in the bands, uh, we can speak of a metal-like semiconductor. You will see a Drude response in terahertz spectroscopy, for example. Um, the thing is, it is still a semiconductor because the equilibrium Fermi energy is in the band gap. Um, but you can drive uh, a system optically so strongly, different mechanisms can play a role, that one of the bands crosses the equilibrium Fermi energy. Then we also have free carriers, but they are at the equilibrium Fermi energy. And then, and only then, we can speak of a transient metal. Yeah. I'm emphasizing this so much and the difference because this is very often mixed up in, in some communities and it makes a huge difference when you think about applications. 
when you have a metal like semiconductor, you still have an energy barrier that you need to overcome if you want to run a current through this material. While in the case of the transient, yeah, so it doesn't work. <laughs> While in the case of the transient metal, you just connect three metals with each other. So it's a huge difference <laughs> in terms of application. All right, so yeah, let me now start with the generation of a surface metal. This work was kind of motivated by this vision in the ultra fast community to uh, revolutionize transistors. Yeah, but you have in transistors, you have the different semiconducting materials, you have uh, the three electrodes. It's very complicated and we want to become smaller and faster. So the idea is, what if we take a material and we drive an insulator to metal transition optically and this is my one and my zero in the transistor. Either it's a metal and it conducts or it's a, an insulator and it doesn't conduct. Yeah, that's, that's uh, the idea. It's a simplification, definitely. <laughs> okay, so um, this can be done, such insulator to metal transition can be done in various ways. And one uh, phase transition type are the so-called mod transitions. And there are different types of mod transitions for uh, the ones who got confused about it. Um, the first one is the one that is driven by chemical doping. Here you have shallow donors and uh, you enhance the doping density and then the electrons start talking to each other, they delocalize and uh, um, a metallic impurity band is being formed that is partially filled and you can have conduction. Um, this is happening in uh, many, many semiconductors and it, uh, so you have the doping concentration and then you have a, an eff a effective radius of the dopant that, uh, that uh, defines this criteria. The other um, famous mod transition is the exciton mod transition, where I mentioned it before already in the bandwidth renormalization phase. So you enhance the exciton density. They also have a bore radius. And at some point, the, the, they collapse and form an electron mole plasma, and you have free carriers. And this has been time resolved already, like more than 20 years ago, by Robert Hubert. Um, um, I think that was back with Alfred Leitenstorff. Anyway, um, so here um, you, you have uh, an, a, a mod transition that is driven by optical excitation. And then to make it even more complicated, there's a third mod transition that if you are in, somehow in the strongly correlated community, which is resulting from uh, the Coulomb repulsion, so a material that would originally be um, um, by the DFT calculation that would be a metal becomes an insulator due to Coulomb repulsion. And then you can, um, by photo excitation, destroy this mod transition. But uh, I see in your faces that this is at all not your, uh, your <laughs> thing. So I'll stop talking about it. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the chemical doping. I mentioned the, the shallow donors. Um, and um, of course, there are also deep donors and they usually do not contribute to conduction simply because uh, the energy barrier is too high. But what you can do is you can photo excite deep donors and create so-called defect excitons, and they will be important when I finally start with my results, because the electron in these defect excitons, it acts like a shallow donor, and suddenly by photo excitation, you can uh, create a situation that is very much like chemical doping, yeah? So in this correlated community, there's a lot of talk about photo doping. This is the only true real photo doping, yeah? because it's really analogous to chemical doping. Okay, so zinc oxide, it has a white band gap, I already said so, but it also has many defects. This is why it's so yellow. And I mean, there are experts in the room on zinc oxide. One important aspect of zinc oxide is that it exhibits persistent uh, photovoltage. So when you shine UV light onto zinc oxide and you measure the conductivity through a wire, zinc oxide wire, 
you will see that the UV light enhances the conductivity significantly by more than, yeah, almost two orders of magnitude. And then you turn off the UV light and the conductivity persists. And that is, um, yeah, a puzzling observation. And the conductivity goes down again when you expose this wire to air. And the reason for it is likely the oxygen in the air that is filling oxygen vacancies. There are theoretical calculations already 20 years old. Here you see that at the, um, at the top of the valence band, you have um, these oxygen, oxygen vacancy states. And then when you ionize these oxygen vacancies, you generate density of states in the region of the Fermi energy, yeah? So the photo excitation create states in the region of the Fermi energy where the conduction happens. So this is one uh, paper supporting the hypothesis that the, um, that the uh, persistent photoconductivity goes back to oxygen vacancies and zinc oxide. So what I will show you here is that we um, photo excite the system and we create defect excitons and um, that we can play with the uh, properties of the system by changing the density of these defect excitons. As a start, I've brought here a photoelectron spectra. So it's photoelectron intensity as a function of energy. Zero is always Fermi energy. And you see that here is a maximum just below the Fermi energy. So normally uh, occupied states and this the intensity of this feature changes as we change the repetition rate of our laser system. So for the ones who have not been working with uh, ultra fast pulse lasers, we have like, we work at kilohertz rates. So this means the pulses come at, at a microsecond difference. And so what we are creating here are more and more defect excitons that have a lifetime that exceeds the inverse repetition rate of our laser system so that we end up in a photostationary population. We always have some defect excitons in our system. And when we change the repetition rate, the intensity changes because the photostationary state is a different one. Here with five kilohertz, we have 200 microseconds that the defect excitons have to decay. And uh, for 200 kilohertz, they are probed after five microseconds. So the signal is higher. Anyway, so we have defect excitons. They have a long lifetime. Can we now use these defect excitons to change something about the electronic properties of zinc oxide? This is also photoelectron intensity in false colors. Again, as a function of energy, this is the Fermi energy. This is the state that I just showed you, but as a function of emission angle. And you see it has a flat dispersion. It's a localized state. It's the defect exciton state. So this is before our pump laser pulse comes. And now I start the movie, which hopefully works. Now at zero, you see the intensity suddenly rise significantly and you see not only that the number of electrons below the Fermi energy has increased, but also the shape has changed. It has become kind of a smiley face, yeah? And this is the delocalization of the electrons in the defect exciton state. Um, of course, one can analyze this also quantitatively. I will show you this in a moment. This is now a different cut through the same data set. Here, again, zero is the Fermi energy. This is time, here is time zero. And the first observation that I want to emphasize is that um, we create electron density and density of states in, near the Fermi energy. So whatever we are doing here, it is definitely not just a transient metal. We are here at the equilibrium Fermi energy of the system. Yeah, that's the discussion I opened earlier. Then we can look at uh, the uh, photoelectron intensity as a function of time. 
and we uh, can monitor uh, three different time constants, two rise times, ultra short, and then a decay time of 220 uh, picoseconds. So it decays um, also on ultra fast time scales. And um, at the same time, we can then look at the dispersion of the electron distribution and take the inverse effective mass as a measure for the degree of localization. So this is plotted here in the light blue markers. I hope you can see that it shows qualitatively the same dynamics as the electron density. What we observe here is a, 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 a transient, a, de a, a dynamic delocalization. Yeah? We put more and more electrons into this state and the more electrons we have, the more delocalized our band becomes, the more and more metallic our state becomes. And then the electrons, uh, electron density decreases again, and the, uh, um, the distribution becomes more and more localized, and um, uh, the less metallic the system becomes. We can um, do this also as a function of excitation density. So not only vary the electron density by just looking at the electron time-dependent electron density, but by exciting it uh, sufficiently strongly. And you see that for low excitation densities, you keep on having a flat dispersion, while uh, after a critical excitation density, you get this nice parabolic shape. And you can plot the inverse effective mass also as a function of pump fluence. And you get like a very nice critical behavior as you would expect it for a real phase transition. And the critical density, the critical fluence is 13.6 um, 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 microjoules per square centimeter. And here I learned that this is not uh, your um, exact field of interest, uh, this is like a factor of thousand smaller than usual photo-induced phase transitions. Normally you are in the millijoule range here. And um, this is quite remarkable. And this also leads to um, the, the, the fast recovery time. You remember it recovers on picosecond time scales. Very often these phase transitions are uh, leading to a hot metallic state that lives for nano micro milliseconds. And due to the um, low excitation density and due to the fact that hot zinc oxide is still a semiconductor, um, this is possible. Yeah. And uh, this is um, quite a nice result if you're into these photo-induced phase transitions. We then wanted to make sure that it's really defect exciton and not something else. So the, in the experiment I showed you already, we used uh, 3.4 EV like resonant with a uh, band um, gap. And um, then we tuned the pump photon energy so that we cannot get across the band gap anymore. And you see that you can see the same behavior also for smaller photon energies. You can uh, do this in a sort of action. Oh, wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> you can plot this in an action spectrum here. So this is the photon energy and the intensity of the metallic uh, feature. And you see that uh, you really need sort of high photon energy. So you cannot do this with 800 nanometers. Um, but it's enough to do it uh, with a photon energy below the band gap. And this means that um, the states responsible for this must be sitting really just on top of the valence band, it must be really deep defects. And this also matches this scenario of oxygen vacancies being responsible. For this. But of course, zinc oxide exhibits many, many, many different types of defects. Yeah. So. I showed you that we can metallize the zinc oxide surface by photo excitation. The main characters of this work were Lukas Bierster and uh, Zesha van Patti. In summary, yeah, we, we do real photo doping, like the real analog to photo doping, which is also reflected in this critical behavior. 
Uh, we can do this close to room temperature and we have this back switching on picosecond time scales. So we believe that this is actually of technological relevance what we've discovered here. Yeah, the take home message is uh, not for this audience. So I will go through this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, let's move on to um, the optoelectronic system where we combine the zinc oxide with, um, with organic molecules and uh, look at the charge separation dynamics. So just this is a reminder, why, why uh, does this not work in zinc oxide? So let me spend a few words on energy level alignment at uh, such interfaces. So this is a zinc oxide band structure. Then you have this potential step here. It's basically the chemical potential for the chemists. This is the work function, yeah. And then we have uh, organic dye molecules. And if they are very far away from each other, you have the vacuum level alignment. And then you will bring them together. You will have uh, a bond dipole formation. It's, it's all very complicated. And then you end up with a certain energy level alignment. And then you photo excite your system and um, the charge uh, separation depends on various factors here. So you can have a, uh, so you create excitons in the, in, the, in the molecule, and then you can either, of course, um, have reduced charge separation because you have a very low density of states or a weak coupling to the density of states. Um, you could have competing processes. Maybe in these molecules, uh, recombination is very quick. And uh, then you have light emission, or you have other, you have uh, charge separation, localization within the molecular film competing with the charge separation, or you can have trap states uh, at the interface in the molecular film. Um, however, I have to say, as zinc oxide is so N type yoked, there is not much room for electron traps, more room for hole traps because all the electron, uh, all the defects below the Fermi energy are already occupied. Yeah? You cannot put another electron there. This is something that is very often forgotten. Okay, so um, yeah, and then of course, you know, can also have polar round formation um, trapping um, at, at the interface um, through hybrid excitons is the last option. Like the electron goes into the zinc oxide and then it uh, kind of cannot leave the interface because the hole is still too attractive. Okay, so the system that we chose to investigate this is the 5P pyridine zinc oxide system. And um, the 5P pyridine molecule, well, it's five phenyl rings and a pyridine end unit. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, not as simple as it might look. <laughs> Anyways, we have spent quite some time with this molecule also, and we started by um, looking at the pure pyridine zinc oxide interface um, and uh, did some uh, spectroscopic analysis. For pyridine, um, you have, however, a different energy level alignment. As it's just one ring, you have a very wide band gap, and actually it has a negative electron affinity. And when you um, put it um, onto zinc oxide, the bond formation of the nitrogen with the zinc oxide and the permanent dipole moment of the pyridine together lead to a gigantic reduction of the chemical potential down to 1.9 eV. Yeah, normal work functions are somewhere between four and five eV. So this is like as if the electrons would flow out of the material <laughs> voluntarily. Yeah, it's a really a strong reduction. This was a collaborative wor work with Oliver Hoffmann in Graz um, and, um, and our experimental work. Yeah, so, and the reason for this is that you cannot have Fermi level pinning, yeah, because of the negative electron affinity. In, in many molecules you put on surfaces have a positive electron affinity. And as soon as you come into the region of Fermi energy, you cannot reduce the chemical potential any further. Okay, um, 
And then 5P periodine uh, has a smaller band gap, but um, generally everything stays the same, except for the fact that the electron affinity is now suddenly positive, but you can quite substantially reduce the work function to 2.6 EV still, yeah, when you uh, absorb the 5P periodine. And then one other aspect uh, is um, in common for both interfaces in both cases we observe an in-gap state just below the fermi energy here and there yeah it's in in the interface region and uh, it must be somehow uh, connected to the to the pyridine binding um, unfortunately theory doesn't find it but yeah it's there um now, in order to um, get an answer um, for the, the charge separation issue, we now perform two different experiments. One is the interfacial excitation, where we use this in-gap state as the initial state for the photo excitation, and then we resonantly excite into the new move of uh, the 5P periodine molecule. Yeah, so this excitation in itself is already a charge transfer. We kind of charge the molecule. And then uh, the second experiment is the intramolecular excitation. That's the usual resonant excitation of the molecule where we determine the um, photon energy that we use with UV vis spectroscopy. Mm. Yeah, so I will show you both results in a moment. This is again photoelectron intensity as a function of energy again with respect to the Fermi energy and as a function of Comperot delay. But now we are looking at the normally unoccupied states. So this feature here lies at 1.8 EV above the Fermi energy. Yeah? Before we've been looking in this region, now we look up here. And um, the, the signal that you see here is the transient population in the LUMO that then very quickly decays on femtosecond time scales. It decays with a time constant of 70 femtoseconds, so this is uh, really ultra fast. This means that the density of states argument really cannot be true. The electrons go away into the conduction end of the zinc oxide very, very quickly. So we have to have strong electronic coupling and sufficient density of states. When we now do the intramolecular excitation, it's the same time axis as above. You can see that the dynamics are longer. Yeah, It takes longer for the population to decay. Um, and um, this means, OK, charge transfer is slowed down. And what is the reason? Well, the reason must be the position of the hole. And um, we. Um, yeah, interpret this as the, um, the, the Coulomb potential here um, constricting the wave function more to the molecular region. So reducing the wave function overlap and therefore the probability of the electron to transfer. But nevertheless, oh, yeah, electron hole interaction, nevertheless, even 350 femtoseconds is still ultra fast yeah? and this is still strong coupling so um, the electron hole interaction on the molecule can also not be the the cause of the reduced um, of the reduced charge separation in zinc oxide hybrid systems so let's have a look at the homo and uh, what it looks like here we collaborated the theory these are ab initio calculations from Olga Tokina and Claudia Draxe. And um, um, they show, OK, we have a localized uh, HOMO. And um, th this is maybe not too exciting, but they, Olga and uh, Claudia can also do beta psi theta uh, equation calculations, which allow now to look really at the optical excitations in, in complex system. The problem is that the 5P pyridine is really too large if you want to add the zinc oxide to this. And so, yeah, we kind of, or well, they kind of used a trick. Yeah, they, they uh, as usual, also for the NP pyridine family, the 
um, homo lumo gap just scales linearly with a number of rings. And um, this uh, is actually not linearly, but here, logarithmically. <laughs> um, and um, with this trick, uh, we were able to simulate the situation using BSC. So when you calculate the, um, the band structure and the excitonic features using BSE for the pyridine zinc oxide system, you find um, that there are hybrid excitons. Yeah, the HOMO sits here in the, in the valence band uh, continuum of the zinc oxide and the electron sits in the conduction band. But this is of course not the situation that we have in our experiment. So what we did was we took the experimental values um, for the LUMO and uh, the, the um, um, optical gap, and then we shifted the HOMO into the band gap, into its position. And this shows that we uh, then, of course, because we do not have this um, hybridization with all the valence band states, we have a very strong localization of holes on the molecule while the electron is sitting in the zinc oxide. And these hybrid excitons, they actually have a very large, oh, oh, very large binding energy of uh, 700 electron volts. That's gigantic, yeah, for such a system. And um, here you see how, when they put the hole onto the paradigm, how the electron is localized in this region, but also kind of, it's not like a point charge, yeah. Okay, so if we now um, consider an electron, an exciton with a binding energy of 700 milli electron volts with respect to the conduction band of the zinc oxide, this means that the electron needs to sit below the Fermi energy. If the electron sits in this exciton state, you have just seen it in the zinc oxide part of the talk, below the Fermi energy, there are no decay channels because everything is occupied. So we expect again to see a very long lived species um, with um, uh, yeah, long lifetime. So how does all this connect to the experiment? Well, we do in fact see a feature with an energy that uh, would match to the binding energy of the experiment. And we see it both with UV and IR single spectra. So we can probe it, pump and probe it with all the um, photon energies that we use in the experiment. But this is not a proof for, um, for any correlation and for any um, this could be also the spectral signature of a simple defect state that is sitting below the Fermi energy. In order to show that this is a hybrid exciton state, we need to show that we do the um, um, excitation in the molecule, and then this generates these excitons, this feature. And a first step to show this is to compare the IR and UV only spectra, take the sum of them and compare it to the situation where you have both photon types on your sample. Because if there is a correlation and you have a state, a photostationary state being built up, you will come to a different intensity. Yeah, because you have a correlation between the laser pulses. And this is what we observe. We see a, a yeah, quite substantial increase of the signal if we have both colors there at the same time. So it's not just a simple uh, occupied um, electronic state. So we have a photostationary state. It must have a lifetime larger than the five microseconds repetition rate in our experiment. Um, now, um, is this the hybrid exciton state? And how do we show that it's a hybrid exciton state? Um, and if it's hybrid excitons, how do they form? Well, then we want to learn something about the formation dynamics of this. And in order to um, learn something about it, we must look 
into whether there is a change um, in the correlated signal depending on the pump road time delay. And this is shown here. This is um, the difference between a spectrum of negative delays where the pump uh, um, comes after the probe and a, a, a spectrum at positive delays. And you see there is, again, at the same energy, a signal. So there is a change of the photostationary state as a function of the pump probe delay, which is, uh, has, I think, not been observed before. Delay-dependent photostationary states. <laughs> yeah. So let's have a look at the dynamics. So I have already discussed um, yeah. William Miller has been seen. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have already discussed the, the um, population dynamics um, in the, in the uh, molecule, um, but we have not looked at what is happening at longer delays. And uh, this is what we see here, yeah? on the time scale of 100 picoseconds, a signal builds up again. And this is the signal that I've just shown you in the single spectra. This, you have a replica, but depending on whether you probe this photostationary state with UV or IR light, but it's the buildup of this photostationary state. And now comes uh, the important thing. The electrons leave the molecule. They are gone. They are, if we don't detect them here, yeah, after one picosecond, the signal is gone. The electrons are in the bulk of the zinc oxide. This is why we do not detect them anymore. Then it's known that the relaxation to the conduction band minimum occurs very quickly in zinc oxide. But they are not there for 100 picoseconds. And then they come back to form a very long-lived state. They come back to the surface. So there must be an attractive force that pulls them back. And like when we talk about scenarios of why um, charge separation doesn't happen in zinc oxide as efficiently, the trap states, the polar arms are very often um, discussed. And while we cannot exclude defects and uh, polar ones as potential traps at such interfaces, we can exclude that this reoccurring signal is coming from defects and polarons because defect and polarons, they do have attractive potentials possibly at the surface, but this wouldn't depend on the excitation mechanism. What we need to see these uh, excitons is that we do the intramolecular excitation. So we need the hole at the molecule this is pulling the electrons back. And this le leads me to the conclusion that it's indeed um, that it's indeed hybrid excitons. So now I've talked and not shown the slide for this. Yeah, there is not much room for such electron attractive states between conduction band and Fermi energy. Um, if it's holes here uh, in this region that we proto-induce, they would be easily filled because it's in the region of the Fermi energy. And our observation is that it's, uh, that it's not independent of the excitation mechanism. Yeah, we need the hole on the molecule for the electrons to come back to the surface. So it's the long range attractive Coulomb potential of the hole that gets them back. And the reason why this works in zinc oxide and not in TiO2 is that zinc oxide has a much lower, like more than a factor of 10 dielectric constant than TiO2. Yeah, And this is also supported, all this uh, interpretation is supported by all these core shell works where they add a screening material to the zinc oxide nanostructures and suddenly they can charge separate. It's like the Coulomb potential is further screened, it's narrowed down, and then you, the electrons can stay away. This is, uh, sorry, it's here on this slide. 
we have a lot of time. We have 100 picoseconds with the electrons in the bulb. So if we can enhance this time or capture either the electrons away from the zinc oxide or the holes in the organic before the electron moves towards the surface, then we can charge separate. So I think it's possible to use zinc oxide in uh, light harvesting um, systems if you understand that you have to do something about the screening and that you have to take out the electrons or holes quickly enough. Yeah, so there is charge separation. And um, for this, I would like to summarize it with great news, strong electronic coupling, organic zinc oxide interfaces, and um, we might have a solution to make zinc oxide feasible. Yeah, so we have ultra fast uh, electron transfer but uh, and hybrid exciton formation, <coughs> but it's delayed by 100 picoseconds. So before we stop, I just wanted to show you that this was really like topic wise only a very small fraction of what we do in the group. We look at molecular motors and switches in solution. We uh, look at femtochemistry. Uh, we uh, are looking into 2D materials by optical spectroscopy. We're uh, also, um, yeah, it's running now. Uh, after the move, it's running again. We can do ultra fast SNOM at optical wavelengths. Um, and uh, this is the team. This was our, our trip last summer in uh, Blau am See on the lighthouse, uh, which we enjoyed very much. And the people who, uh, oh yeah, this I also will mention, the people who joined the projects I showed today are highlighted here. So Zesha and Lukas, I already mentioned, uh, Jan Christoph Deinert has done a lot of zinc oxide work and Ezi also joined us um, in the five peer paradigm, which was mainly headed by Lukas. And then I should mention that the group just moved from the, just moved, yeah. I was appointed in 2020 to the Humboldt University and like, uh, one year ago, the labs were finished <laughs> and uh, half a year ago, we uh, finally had the last office done. And one month ago, also the corridor was renovated. So we have <laughs> arrived now. <laughs> Please come and visit. The results that I have presented though, they are all uh, coming from the Fritz Haber time. Yeah. And we also had funding collaborations that I want to acknowledge. And last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention.